Chicago Heights, Illinois is where we are for this video. It used to be a gangster's paradise. It also used to be an industrial powerhouse. Not so much anymore. It's lost nearly half of its peak population. We'll get into all of that in this video. Well, 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 what do we have here right off of the bat? It was probably nothing, really. Probably just someone speeding by on Lincoln Highway like everyone else does. Don't want to speed too much around here, though. The Popo are all about patrolling US-30 through this stretch, especially in Fort Heights directly to the east, the city that lost its police department years ago, as now the Cook County Sheriff patrols that town. These days, more often than not, police working this particular area are bored out of their minds and spend their time looking for speeders like you and me. So the next time that you roll through Ford Heights and, you know, the eastern area of Chicago Heights on Lincoln Highway, just go ahead and let those angry hill jacks go faster than you and pass you by. So that way, you're in the clear in case one of the boys and gals in blue are hanging out nearby. Well, moving on now as I start the video driving around the east side of Chicago Heights. And the second that you enter this part of town and look around, you automatically get the feeling that things here are kind of blighty, kind of ugly, kind of crimey, kind of grimy, depressing, sad, empty, insubstantial, abandoned, decayed, neglected, you name it. This part of town by far and away is the most demoralizing part of Chicago Heights. The east side is, and always has been, very industrial, very blue collar, tough, gruff, and grimy. All of that over time has resulted in lower property values, which is why the residential areas in this half of town are mostly empty. It's not like this throughout the entire town, though, as there are some areas in the west side that look completely different, and we'll see more of that later in the video. We'll come back to this spot in the driving tour in just a bit, as I want to briefly jump over towards downtown Chicago Heights. You know, when I first came here, I was kind of shocked about how empty this downtown area looked. It's a very eerie feeling. There's a few buildings left. Most of it is torn down though, and it's just empty. No traffic, no cars anywhere you look. No cars anywhere. Granted it's, you know, early on a weekend morning, but it's like there's nothing here. Yeah, not much else to say. Nothing really in downtown Chicago Heights anymore. Well, it wasn't always this way in Chicago Heights, obviously, as the downtown area used to be full of shopping, business, commerce, entertainment, and life. It served as the center of activity for not only the city of Chicago Heights, but also for the surrounding area, as back in the early 1900s, Chicago Heights was the only true city for about a 15 mile radius. But it's safe to say that Chicago Heights' best days are in the past. We can get deep into the history of Chicago Heights later in the video. Meanwhile, it's surprising to me that there isn't much info available on this building here. 1700 Holstead Street. When you drive into downtown Chicago Heights, this building clearly stands out among the others. According to Landmarks Illinois, 1700 Holstead was constructed sometime in the 70s and was called the first national bank tower. Google Street View has this shot of the building from 2007 in which it appeared to be in the beginning stages of vacancy. The sign from the 2007 shot is unreadable and it's no longer there today, but the sign suggests that there is at least some kind of business operating in the building either at the time of the shot or not too long before the shot was taken. Also what's noticeable is the smaller for sale sign right next to it. funny because I started the day up in the northwestern part of the Chicago area over by the O'Hare Airport. Nice sunny day, not a cloud in the sky, and then you come down here to the southern half of Cook County, things started to look doom and gloom, kind of like the economy of this part of the region. How ironic. Really, it was just a thick layer of morning fog that burned up as the morning went on. <laughs> 
So back to where we were on the industrial east side, let's now talk about what things are like today in Chicago Heights before diving deep into the city's history. The town saw a peak population of just under 41,000 in 1970. Today, that number has dropped all the way down to 27,480. But that number was from 2020. And at the time of me uploading this video, it's been four years since the official 2020 census count. In between, the Census Bureau will provide estimates on a per-year basis, which is based off of several types of data, such as reported births, reported deaths, along with in-and-out migration. While the latest estimates available show that Chicago Heights has lost about 1,500 additional people over the last four years. Not good. The rest of the economic stats? Also not good. The median household income is about $20,000 per year less than the median household income for the U.S. as a whole. Sure, there are plenty of places with lower median household incomes than Chicago Heights, but there are more places with higher numbers. Less than 20% of adults 25 and older hold a bachelor's degree or higher, and the median home value is $134,000. I honestly thought that number would have been lower than that, but it's not. Lastly, the poverty rate is 23.3%, which is another number that I thought would have been higher. So the numbers don't look good, but at the same time, the numbers are slightly better than I thought they would be. When you look at the crime rates, however, those numbers are not better than I thought they would be. They're actually a lot worse. The violent crime rate for Chicago Heights is 1,900 for every 100,000 residents, or six times higher than the national rate. The property crime rate isn't as extreme as that's at 2,600 for every 100,000 residents, but let's do a search for Chicago Heights on Google News and see what comes up. 50-year-old man charged with stabbing two boys at a park, killing one in Chicago Heights. A 13-year-old died from that event. FBI investigating an armored truck robbery of a grocery store in Chicago Heights. Two shot and killed during a fight outside of Chicago Heights' home. Three Chicago Heights men dead by gunshot. Shooting in Chicago Heights leaves 18-year-old dead. Girl, five, slain. Grandparents charged with murder. I mean, come on. A five-year-old girl? Really? Very unfortunate. The data also says how the crime rate here has more than doubled since 2018, with the violent crime rate for Chicago Heights being at a rate of 872 for every 100,000 residents that year. Really, crime in Chicago Heights has been a major problem for most of our lifetimes, but in recent years, there's been a very noticeable spike in violent crime, and it's something that the city should be very concerned with. All of those news stories that I highlighted have occurred within a year of me uploading this video. Altogether, there were 12 homicides in Chicago Heights in 2023. There's only one Cook County suburb that saw a higher number of homicides, that being Harvey, eight miles to the north. Harvey saw 13 murders in 2023. Harvey also has a population of 20,000, or about 6,000 fewer than Chicago Heights, giving Harvey a higher ratio. The suburb of Dalton, Illinois also saw 12 murders in 2023. Dalton is about 14 miles to the northeast and also has a population of around 20,000, so Dalton also has a higher homicide rate than Chicago Heights does. So despite how bad things are in Chicago Heights these days on paper, other nearby cities have seen a spike in violent crime at a worse rate. However, the high crime rates over the years in Chicago Heights, among other factors, have led to the abandonment that we see here in the east side of the city today.
Well, let's start going over the history timeline for Chicago Heights, shall we? The first known European settler in the area was Absalom Wells, who built a cabin on a ridge above Thorn Creek in the 1830s. If you can't spot where Thorn Creek is on the map, it's the dark squiggly line that goes in a northeast and southwest direction. If you still can't spot Thorn Creek on the map, then you're probably one of those who never knows where they're going because you never learned how to read a map. So if that's you, have fun trying to navigate the rest of your life. Meanwhile, there's actually a historic marker at the intersection of Chicago Road and 13th Streets that marks where Mr. Absalom Wells' 1833 cabin was constructed. It's a shame that it isn't still here today, or we would be celebrating the 200th anniversary of the first cabin in Chicago Heights. Also, thanks to Adgorn on waymarking.com for posting this picture of it, so I didn't have to get out of my car and do it myself. Much appreciated. By the 1840s, farms started to spring up in the area surrounding Wells' cabin, and a community known as Thorn Grove was developed. During this time, before any development occurred, there were a few homes in Thorn Grove that were stops along the Underground Railroad. In the upcoming decades, what was originally called Thorn Grove started to be called Bloom in 1849 after Bloom Township, which was surveyed as one of the original 25 Cook County townships that were drawn out during the same year. At this point, the community was still really small. So small that this Cook County map from 1851 didn't even have a community on the map where Bloom, or where Thorn Grove, was. Instead, it has various names of landowners and it says how Bloom Township had a population of 740. Huh, kind of seems like the east side has a population of only 740 these days, with all of the emptiness and abandonment that is seen throughout the neighborhood. Also, while still on the subject of the state of the current neighborhood, I'm heading south on 5th Avenue, right? Well, maybe you'll notice what I noticed as I continue to head south on this street, and that is that there are no stop signs for heading south on 5th Avenue at any of the intersections where there clearly should be some stop signs. Now you can see the outlines of stop signs for traffic that's heading in the opposite direction, but luckily for me, there was no traffic when I was cruising around this part of Chicago Heights. Some further investigation showed that this actually used to be a one-way street with the one-way being traffic that headed north while I am heading south. So that explains why there are no stop signs for traffic that is heading south. Although the fact that the city never bothered to put up stop signs for traffic heading south even though they discontinued the one-way street designation for 5th Avenue just further proves the neglect that the city has had for its east side neighborhood. Anyway, things were pretty sleepy in the area for a while as it wasn't until 1892, or almost 60 years after Wells' cabin was first built, when Chicago Heights started to take shape. The name of Chicago Heights was chosen as a way to attract new industrial growth. This was during an era of high societal unrest in the blue collar industries in Chicago, so the idea for companies to be able to expand further away from the city was ideal to be able to escape potential riots and protests. So at that time, a group of Chicago developers started to envision Chicago Heights as being an outer ring industrial suburb. This group was led by no one other than Charles Wacker, the same Wacker that the famous Wacker Drive in the Chicago Loop was named after. The Wacker-led group of developers ended up acquiring and then giving away land for free to industrial companies to gain momentum on new development. In 1893, Inland Steel was established here, before building a larger mill in 1901 along Lake Michigan in Indiana, in what is now known as the Indiana Harbor. The steel industry has deep roots in Chicagoland's history, and the city of Chicago Heights is proud to be able to claim some of that history. Inland Steel continued as a company all the way through 1998, and today the assets that once belonged to Inland Steel are now a part of Cleveland Cliffs, which is a steel manufacturer based out of Cleveland, Ohio. The steel industry is still present today in Chicago Heights, 
just not in the same way as today. There's several different steel scrap yards or junkyards or steel distributors in town. Another thing that helped Chicago Heights grow into being a major industrial center is the fact that there were several major highways constructed through town. Those highways being the Salk Trail, Dixie Highway, and Lincoln Highway. On top of that, there were several railroad lines that served Chicago Heights. Well, Salk Trail was an old Indian trail that extended all the way from Rock Island, Illinois to Detroit, Michigan. Dixie Highway was a series of roads with the branch in Chicago Heights connecting Chicago with Miami, Florida. Lastly, Lincoln Highway was one of the first transcontinental highways in the United States, with the original route running from Times Square in New York City all the way to Lincoln Park in San Francisco. For a brief time, Chicago Heights earned the nickname of being the Crossroads of America, being what, like the only 2,000th municipality in the Midwest to call themselves that? Well... Back to the industrial growth, as it wasn't long before a wide range of blue-collar industries made their presence known in the area, forming the seemingly everlasting identity for Chicago Heights. The makeup of the economy included steel mills, the production of baking powder, chemical plants including sulfuric acid, to meat packing, to glass bottle production, to woodworking, to foundries, to tool dye factories. Chicago Heights was quickly growing to be an industrial mecca outside of Chicago. In 1900, Chicago Heights was incorporated as a city with a population of just over 5,000 people. But by 1910, that population grew to be 15,000. Up here on the right is the Lincoln Gavin Elementary School, which is still in use, despite the emptiness of the neighborhood blocks that surround it. On the other side of the school are two nice-looking old church buildings, the first one being Greater Mount Hermon, the second one being... Payne Chapel. Well, with Chicago Heights growing by 10,000 people from 1900 to 1910, that was a growth rate of 185%, making it one of the fastest growing cities in the country at the time. Also noted is that from 1870 to 1900, Chicago was considered to be the fastest growing city in the world. But with Chicago Heights, people were coming here at such a fast pace that the construction of new housing couldn't keep up with the demand. With thousands of new industrial jobs, there were thousands of immigrants coming to the city too. There were quite a few large ethnic groups in Chicago Heights, including German, Polish, Slovak, Lithuanian, Irish, and African Americans. But no other ethnic group was represented more in Chicago Heights than Italians were. By 1910, Chicago Heights was 25% Italian, giving it a larger percentage of Italians than any other city in America. For more illustration, only 4% of Chicagoland at the time was Italian. Most of them were unskilled laborers who were just following the companies who were moving away from the more expensive and overly crowded city. Italians continued to be the majority ethnic group in Chicago Heights throughout the 1940s. Additionally, most of the Italians lived in the part of town that we've been driving around so far because this was the poverty-stricken part of town and it was also closer to where they worked at the factories. So yeah, the east side was always considered to be the worst part of town, even during the peak years of Chicago Heights. One neighborhood that's called The Hill was early on given the nickname of Hungry Hill due to the high poverty levels that the neighborhood saw. This neighborhood also sat right next to the Inland Steel Factory, which obviously isn't ideal. I mean, who wants to live right next to a steel mill? On the flip side, the wealthier white families settled in the west part of town. So a few things to point out here. This might be the first open store that we have seen in this video and we've been driving around Chicago Heights for 20 minutes and we're also starting to see some blue skies. How ironic. Here's another nice historic building. Engraved in the stone above the front door is Washington School, 1928. Today it's the Washington McKinley Elementary School. While driving around the west side you can tell that at least this part of Chicago Heights used to be pretty nice, as the near west side has a nice collection of Victorian-style mansions. 
It might be hard to picture downtown Chicago Heights ever being much of anything when you see it nowadays, but it used to be a pretty nice downtown. At least when you drive through the near west side, you can get a glimpse of the Victorian style mansions and everything still looks pretty nice. Well, one thing that's important to note about what life was like here would be the working conditions inside of the steel mills. In 1923, life at the steel mill was described as a 12 hour shift of hearing deafening noise from the machines shaving steel to its desired shape through what was called a straightening machine. People wouldn't be able to hear each other talk inside of the mill unless they were in arm's reach away and were screaming at the top of their lungs. Workers would eat sandwiches with oil all over their hands. Employees would fall asleep on the floors with all of the noise going on as well. And since life was so tough for these workers, men would often come home and abuse their wives and kids as a result of their minds and bodies not being able to handle the harsh environments of working these long and dreadful shifts. Because so much manpower was involved, accidents often occurred. These accidents could range from damaging equipment to an injury or even a death. All of that sacrifice just for trying to make enough money to provide for their families. As the Great Depression hit in 1929, hundreds of jobs were lost. Despite that, Chicago Heights continued to grow. In 1939, the steel industry was able to rebound through demands of World War II before seeing another crash once the war was over. Fast forward to 1956, and the Ford Motor Company built a stamping plant east of Chicago Heights. For a long time, the Ford plant wasn't in the city limits, but in 1987, that changed. The village of East Chicago Heights was attempting to annex the plant. They even renamed their village to Ford Heights to kiss up to the Ford Motor Company, but Ford continued to go with Chicago Heights despite the effort. While there were plenty of ups and downs in the economy over the years, and Chicago Heights continued to grow until it saw its peak population in 1970 at just under 41,000 people. From 1970 forward, industry took a long and steady decline, and it was an economic spiral. The industry leaving triggered all other aspects of the quality of life in Chicago Heights, and everything started to go down. Now that we've gone over the economic history and everything that there is to talk about there, let's talk about the long history of organized crime in Chicago Heights. It all dates back to when the city was starting to form. With loads of blue-collar, unskilled workers came a culture that was suitable for illegal activity. As I mentioned earlier, life in the factories was really hard. That encouraged activities among the community such as gambling, prostitution, and a lifestyle of heavy drinking during the Prohibition era. The Chicago Outfit was one of the more dominant gangs in Chicagoland during the early 20th century. The Outfit was also an Italian-based mob, so Chicago Heights was a perfect location for the Outfit to set up shop. The Chicago Outfit was, of course, led by Al Capone. What made Chicago Heights a perfect place for mob operations was that it was far enough away from the city to be able to stay undercover. The main routes through town and the railroads made it easy for the mob to sell products and make a profit. The town was remote enough for dumping of substances or even bodies in nearby forests. It also can't be emphasized enough how attractive Chicago Heights was to the outfit based on the Italian population alone because Italians during this era faced many economic challenges. There were societal and cultural forces that put Italians across the country at an economic disadvantage. That alone helped form a tight-knit bond among Italians within not only Chicago Heights, but within other urban pockets spread throughout America, which helped form the Italian mob. For all of those reasons, Chicago Heights was able to flourish as a gangster's paradise, especially during the Prohibition era. It was one of the largest hubs for underground alcohol trade in the country. Beer was made in town everywhere during the Prohibition, as it was made in the basements of homes and restaurants in town, while alcohol was imported from Canada through Detroit. So if you live in an older home in Chicago Heights and you have a large basement, maybe, just maybe, your home was used to make beer during the Prohibition era and it was sold from Chicago Heights, the outfit distributed product throughout the Midwest. Legend has it 
that Capone dug up tunnels to store product in Chicago Heights. As time went on, the mob was pretty much able to do whatever they wanted in Chicago Heights. The illegal black market sales and gambling provided enough revenue for Chicago Heights to be able to overcome the challenges of the Great Depression. It gave the town economic prosperity. And that gave the outfit a positive viewpoint among the community's residents, if you will. It also helped that Chicago Heights police officers kindly accepted bribes from the mob. It said that up to 50% of police officers in town were to have accepted bribes from the Chicago outfit. Some cops even went as far to help distribute alcohol sales. But yeah, this is how gangs operated in the early 20th century. Pleasant appearance to the public, even donating funds to charities to help people in need, never dressing casual, always in a suit and tie. Al Capone himself was considered to be the Robin Hood of Chicago Heights for a brief time. While Capone led the Chicago outfit with branches all over Chicagoland, he spent a lot of time in Chicago Heights, and the branch down here eventually became the largest contributor to the Chicago outfit out of all of the branches. Capone's friend, Jim Emery, was the leader of the Chicago Heights branch from 1928 throughout the 1940s. Capone was even the godfather of Emery's daughter, Vera, which is the girl next to him in this photo here. It's believed by some historians that the plans for the infamous St. Valentine's Day Massacre were drawn up at Emery's house here in Chicago Heights. While the St. Valentine's Day Massacre was going on in Chicago, Capone was hanging out at his Florida home, despite him being the one that ordered the attack. It's also believed that the gunman spent time at Emory's Chicago Heights home while traveling to and from the scene of the massacre, as the suspects originated from Indiana. The massacre was ordered by Capone in response to a rival Northside gang attempting to hijack a shipment of alcohol that was being imported from Canada. Once the Prohibition era ended, the outfit continued to operate in Chicago Heights through the form of gambling operations, strip joints, and prostitution. Emery's territory expanded to include everything between Joliet and Northwest Indiana, 65th Street in the city of Kankakee, 36 miles south of Chicago Heights. It was one of the largest gang territories in the country from a geographic standpoint. Other gangs gained a presence in Chicago Heights in the 1960s when public housing was constructed in town. These projects were built on the east side of town, where the majority of the Italian population had lived. When black families moved in, most of the white people on the east side either moved to the west side or out of Chicago Heights altogether. The 1960s is also the last decade that Chicago Heights saw any sort of population or economic growth. In the 1960s, when the public housing was constructed here, the Black Pea Stones started to gain a large presence in Chicago Heights just like they did in many of the other South Chicago suburban communities wherever public housing was being constructed. Violent crime during this time grew significantly, all at the same time of industrial jobs disappearing faster than ever before. Additionally, there is a wave of Hispanic immigration that came into Chicago Heights in the 1980s, and they brought their own gang affiliations with them to add to the several street gangs that were already in the east side of Chicago Heights. With all of that gang activity and all that violent crime, that's why the east side of Chicago Heights today looks the way that it does, as high rates of violent crime over the years, along with being nearby to the industrial pollutants, has lowered property values to the extreme, and has made the east side an incredibly undesirable place to live. 
We'll come back to this spot after checking out Bloom High School. This is definitely one of the more impressive high school buildings that I've seen personally. The school was once a highly performing academic school, but today families try to avoid sending their kids here. The school opened in 1900, the same year that Chicago Heights incorporated as a city. The athletic teams go by the Trojans. There's a second high school in town, that being Marion Catholic High School. It's off of Joe Orr Road on the far north end of town. It's a smaller school, but it's also a better school if you can afford to send your kids here. The mascot is the Spartans, and of all people, Patriots Super Bowl champion Rodney Harrison is an alumni. Let's head back to where we were a minute ago, as currently we're making our way towards the Hill neighborhood. Up ahead, the street turns right, goes underneath some railroad tracks, and once we do that, we'll be in the Hill, or the Hungry Hill, as they say, where it's really just an extension of what we've seen already throughout the east side, although not quite as empty and not quite as blighty. Well, people, it is now that time. What did we learn in this video? We learned that you can't always trust the integrity of a foundation of a home in Chicago Heights because it might be hollow for underground storage of liquor during the Prohibition era, and you can't always trust a gangster's Riviera, but you can always trust Chris's livability score. Fun fact, as this building here that we're looking at was where one of the top members of Al Capone's Chicago Heights Outfit branch lived. Frankie Laporte once lived on the second floor of this building right at the intersection. All right, so on with the livability score. The first category is education. The schools aren't good here. No good way to put it. Education gets a five out of 20. Crime is out of control in Chicago Heights too, still to this day, unfortunately so. So crime gets a four out of 20. Downtown is the next category, and downtown is no good. There's nothing there, 2 out of 20. The two points are sympathy points at that, because really, there's one block along Auto Boulevard where there are some businesses left in some historic buildings, but really, downtown Chicago Heights is a sad place to visit these days. Next up, the economy. Guess what, that's poor too. There are some manufacturers in town still, some small businesses along the west side thoroughfares, but overall businesses have been leaving Chicago Heights, like this restaurant here, that has supposedly been in town for 75 years. The restaurant is also an Italian restaurant, so that's not good when your legacy shops and restaurants leave for property in other nearby cities, as what happened with this place. Economy gets a 4 out of 20. The economy score is all based on the opportunity that residents have to live a successful life, and Chicago Heights just doesn't offer that. If it wasn't a part of a larger populated area where you could find better opportunities in nearby cities, the economy would probably get a 1 out of 20. Could you imagine a city like Chicago Heights far out in the boonies like if you know the state of Illinois, you thought Danville was bad? Actually, yeah, Danville is pretty bad, and that town is on its way to look like Chicago Heights. All right, anyway, next category is recreational opportunities. There aren't that many here. There's a long pedestrian and bike path that nicely connects to some of Chicago Heights neighborhoods, but that's it. That gets a four out of 20. History is easily the most impressive thing about Chicago Heights. You can find it in some of the historic mansions on the west side. You can find it in the city's high school. You can find the bad history as well by just driving through the east side and trying to picture a community with thousands of industrial jobs. 
Nonetheless, Chicago Heights has a strong history with the Italian community and it's a history that's worth preserving. And it's one that I feel like enough people care about to where Chicago Heights might get some kind of investment to try to help save the community. History gets a 17 out of 20. People ask me all the time, why does history matter in the livability score? What does history have to do with the quality of life? Well, that's what it is. You know, people see potential in a community with a rich history, and that can bring some opportunities with it, such as investments to help turn things around. Sorry, Fort Heights to the east, but what's true is true. Anyway, next up is amenities, which there aren't that many in town at all. Three out of 20 there. The last category is cost of living, which it won't cost you anything more than a Twix bar to find somewhere to live in this city, although some of the properties here I feel like are overpriced given the current state of the town. So for that reason, Chicago Heights cost of living gets an 18 out of 20. Sorry, but uh, no house in Chicago Heights, in my opinion, is worth more than 250 grand, at least right now. All in all, the Chris Livability score for Chicago Heights, Illinois is 57 out of 160. Not good. That ties it with East St. Louis, Illinois, of all places. Wow, yeah, didn't see that one coming. There is one more thing to point out up ahead, which would be the house that Al Capone once owned at the corner of 26th and Chicago Road. Anyway, when I stop to think about it, it's not that crazy to say that East St. Louis is on the same level as Chicago Heights. I really shouldn't be surprised because... While East St. Louis is definitely way more blighted, empty, depressing, and sad looking than Chicago Heights is, the violent crime rate in Chicago Heights currently is about double that of what's in East St. Louis, and quite frankly, I would say that downtown East St. Louis has more life than downtown Chicago Heights. Crazy to say that maybe, but I think it's true. Poverty is also much higher in East St. Louis than it is in Chicago Heights, but that's because Chicago Heights is within a 30-minute drive of much better economic opportunity than East St. Louis is. So there's some things that Chicago Heights is better at. There's some other things that, quite frankly, East St. Louis is better at than Chicago Heights is these days. Well, if you want to see more of Chicago Heights, and trust me, there is more to see of this place, make sure to subscribe to my second channel called Chris Harden's Travel Archives, where I'll have a second video uploaded on Chicago Heights. The link for my channel is down below, and in my second video on Chicago Heights, I'll show you all of the footage that I filmed, but didn't use in this video. There's an entire section of town that's run down and rough looking that has plenty of abandoned homes, and there's also a lot more nicer looking older mansions in the second video, so make sure to check it out if you want to see more of what Chicago Heights looks like. Well, obviously, I think that the strong Italian history here is pretty neat. It's not very common that a city in the U.S. has quite a strong history with Italians like Chicago Heights does. But unfortunately, there's not much in town to show for it these days, and that's very disappointing. Quite honestly, it kind of reminds me of Pole Town in Detroit, although just north of the Pole Town neighborhood in Detroit is the separate city of Hamtramck, which does preserve the Polish culture pretty well. Anyway, of the historic buildings that still stand, those are pretty neat, such as Bloom High School, the historic mansions on the west side, yeah, those are pretty neat to look at. But it's underwhelming what downtown has to offer these days. You know, if you've never been to Chicago Heights before and you're curious and you want to explore the city, driving into downtown Chicago Heights is like the equivalent of buying tickets to like an old timer rock band. It's like your favorite childhood rock band. And then you show up, the lead singer is drunk and can't remember the words that he wrote to the song 30 years ago. That's what that is like. Completely disappointing, completely underwhelming, not worth seeing really. Well, hey, if you enjoyed this video, you'll probably be interested in seeing my video on the neighboring village of Ford Heights right here. You also might like checking out my Chicago Suburbs playlist, which is right here. Peace.